Good morning, please stand and worship with us. Pentecost Sunday, which is the day we celebrate God sending his spirit on his people so that it can dwell in the hearts of all those who believe in him. And so in honor of that, we're going to invite down four people to read Acts 1 verse 8 to us in four different languages to represent all the tongues and nations.
Okay, I guess just two. <laughs> Before we go back into worship, I also want to just say that today is Mission Sunday, um, so we're uh, recognizing all our different mission partners, and in honor of that, we have, after this next song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, we're going to have people from Honduras, Ethiopia, Colombia, I think that's it, there might be one other place, that are going to lead us in worship. Um, so we're going to sing Open the Eyes of My Heart, and then they'll lead us in the rest of the songs. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart.
morning our tithes are going to go to New Life Ministries, um, which is everything from our kids' ministries, from the nursery all the way up to our seniors' ministries. It touches everything. And even right now, uh, our youth ministry is out on the SMR, which is the Spiritual Maturity Retreat. And so our youth right now are on Vancouver Island, and they're, they're learning to grow together in their faith closer to God. So this is what the, our, minute, our tithe are going to be going to this morning. So you can give by coming down and giving in the boxes here below or is just the ways for you to give online. Would you please bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we come before you this morning with hearts filled with compassion, filled with joy, filled with uh, peace, because you have given that. God, your compassion to us, your love, your joy for us, the peace that you, only you can provide. God, we thank you, Lord, that your spirit leads us, your spirit guides us, your spirit equips us. God, and we ask that your spirit would lead us now to give the way that you would like us to give. God, that it would turn into some fruit, God. Our hearts aren't just to give out of religion or out of duty, but our hearts are to give so that it produces fruit for your kingdom, God. Each one of us are a result of fruit through the gospel, God. And I thank you that, that we were able to receive that good news. And so we ask, Lord, that it would, this would, our tithes and offerings today would go to produce more fruit, more people to come to know you in deeper, in deeper ways. So we commit this to you, Father, in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. You can stay seated for this next song as you bring your offering. Where if you're just reflecting, there's a lot of words to this song. So if you know it, feel free to sing along. But if you don't, just uh, meditate on what the words are saying. And This is my worship, this is my offering, in every moment I withhold nothing, I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it, and even in suffering, I have to believe. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you stay, be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to find my own way. I'm done chasing feelings.
when all hope is gone and your word is all I got I just have to believe you still bring water from the rocks to satisfy my thirst and to love me at my and even when I don't remember, you remind me of my word. I don't trust my ways. I'm trading in my thoughts. I've laid down everything. Cause you're all that I want. I've Welcome to New Life this morning. Isn't it great to be in community? Um, I just love it. Uh, my name is Kevin DeWold, and I have the privilege of serving on the missions team here at New Life, and also the privilege of being the service host this morning. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and the day we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, empowering us to be witnesses of Jesus locally, regionally, and globally, fulfilling Jesus' commission in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We are grateful that we can support our missionaries, Fred Victory, the Barnhorn family, Eve, Paul, Fernando, Trevino, living that out in various countries in the world. And also our mission partners, World Renew and Diaconia Nationale in Laure, Honduras, Hope for Cora in Ethiopia, Brand New Life Ministries in Colombia, Esperanza Ministries in Vancouver Island, and Joshua House right here in Abbotsford. What a blessing they all are. And we want to especially thank our partners in Honduras and Ethiopia and Colombia for helping us to celebrate a Pentecost Sunday this morning, as we saw in the video. Wasn't that amazing? I just love seeing brothers and sisters just worshiping Christ in their own culture and their own language. It's awesome. If you are new here, um, you're invited to fill out a Connect card. Kind of looks like this. That's in the seat pockets uh, around the, uh, the auditorium here. 
um, um, submit, fill it out and submit it to the info booth or collection boxes that are in the lobby or around the, uh, around the church here. And if you're online, the online host will send a link in the comments section, which you can fill out and submit as well. Profession of Faith Bibles. We have three youth doing Profession of Faith next Sunday, June 12th. Tiana Bugilink, Sophia Siebiga, and Leah Dieleman. Each student will receive a Bible afterwards. But before we give the Bibles, we ask that as a congregation, you can underline a meaningful verse in their Bible. Last week, I took the time to highlight in their Bibles, and I found the Bible is just such an amazing book. So I started Genesis 1, but by Deuteronomy 12, I was starting to cramp up. So maybe just stick to your favorite verses. Also, please sign your name next to it, because maybe they'll see your name next to a passage and come and ask you, why is that verse special to you? And make that connection. For example, one of them may come to me, come to me later and ask, why did I highlight the book of Numbers? Well, I am an accountant after all. <laughs> the Bibles are in the back of the auditorium you know, with highlighters and pens. So please take the time to highlight your favorite passage and put your name or initials next to it. That would be great for them. New Life Live is happening on Wednesday, June 8th at 7 p.m. And this is one of two annual meetings for New Life members. This event, is, it, this event is in person at New Life Church and will also be live streamed. We would love to see all of you there, our church family, gather that evening to stay informed and receive information pertaining to the proposed budget and nominations for the Board of Elders. That requires your affirmation. The New Life package is available at the info booth in the foyer. Um, there's also, you can find the link for the live stream and a digital copy of the package and more details. Um, you can visit newlifecrc.ca slash events. Seniors lunch is also happening today for those over 65 years of age. And I understand that our brother Coon Bugling just had a birthday, so he may not qualify. I might see you up there. It'll be upstairs in room 303. All right. Kids' dismissal will soon be happening. For Little Lights, children ages 3 to 5, you exit to the door on my left. Uh, for Kids' Church, that's for grades 1 to 5, we dismiss through the door on my right. If you are new and visiting or unsure of where to bring your children, please find a kids' attendant that will be at either door. And if you did not check your, in your child when you arrived this morning, please go with them and with the attendant get them checked in uh, at a station. We are now entering our three-minute fellowship time. On the first Sunday of each month since October, we have been showing a little, uh, a bit of, we've been showing a bit of what different New Life Ministries have been up to. So we are on our last one, and during these three minutes, you will see a slideshow of the cadets, which is a boys' program for boys in grades three to seven. So now, please welcome and greet one another with a piece of Christ. And if you're looking for a question, I want to ask them. Have you been to any of the countries our missionaries currently serve? In Colombia, Ethiopia, um, the Middle East, or Nigeria? Thank you. Cadet Bannock, the best. Beautiful stick, well cooked, sugar inside. Mm.
Nice, thank you. All right, find your seats, please. Try to find your seats in the dark now. <laughs> Right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. I didn't know if you'd notice. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Good. I was glad you noticed, George. Thank you. <laughs> I'm excited to be here with you all today on this special day. Uh, as Kevin said, today is our Mission Sunday, and today is we're celebrating Pentecost. Um, and uh, like Kevin said, Pentecost is the ascension of Christ to heaven to sit at the right hand of God and the Holy Spirit coming upon his people, upon his followers. Um, Pentecost is also the f- fulfillment of Jesus' promise to us that he would send another counselor to come in his place. And John 14, verse 16 says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And then in verse 26, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Pentecost is the day that we celebrate that God came and dwelt with us, dwelt among us, so that we could have relationship with him and commune with him. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears me, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and them with me. Pentecost is the day that we remember that the Holy Spirit came upon his people, his disciples, and then to those who accepted the good news. Acts 2.1-4 says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And Pentecost is also the day that we celebrate that the gospel went out to all tribes, all nations, all tongues, all peoples. This is the day that the gospel became available to us. As Gentiles, this is the day that we were able to enter into the covenant and we became children of God, heirs of that covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. And we see this in Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3 or 2 to 3. And at the end of it says, all peoples on earth, all peoples will be blessed through you. This is a significant day in our Christian faith calendar. This is a significant day for us. And for our uh, Mission Sunday, the missions team and Pastor Nathan asked if I would share some of my own missions experience, some of my own stories of how I saw God at work in my time in missions. And so I'm going to be sharing that this morning. I'm going to be sharing just mostly some stories of how I saw God move. But before I do that, I want to share a couple passages that have really influenced me and helped me to define my call and how I walk that out better. The first one is Acts 1.8. And we already heard that. We heard that in a couple different languages. And, um, and I think that's really fitting because when the Holy Spirit came upon his disciples then, they all spoke in different languages. And it's so awesome to see them worshiping in different languages and different peoples in their own ways. And that's, that's the Holy Spirit coming upon all people everywhere. And so Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power. You will receive power. I want us to focus on this. The power described here is the manifestation of God's power through his people. This power. But for what reason? What's the reason of this power? So that we can perform signs and wonders? No. What's the main reason? So that we can be viewed as holy and and these people that were touched by God that are so different? No, that's not the main reason. It's in this passage Power so that you might be my witnesses locally, regionally, globally, everywhere you find yourselves. Power so that you can advance the gospel. The Holy Spirit, whom we have that dwelling inside of each one of us, the Holy Spirit is the counselor, our advisor. He convicts us, instructs us, leads us, and he speaks to us. The Holy Spirit is how we have relationship with God. But the Holy Spirit is also God's power made manifest on earth through his people for the advancement of the gospel. And that's what I want to share about today. I want to talk about the calling that each one of us have as his disciples, as people who have the counselor, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, 
so that we can share the gospel, the good news of salvation and relationship with God. But I guess the question for all of us is, how do I live that out? How do I personally live out Acts 1.8? How do I live that out in my own life? Does that mean that I need to go sell everything I own and go move to some shanty in India? Or do I need to go live in a mud hut in Africa? I think that's the mentality that we have when we think about missions, right? And I think that's something that holds us back. So if I have to do that, that, that means missions is so foreign to me. But then we have to ask ourselves, how do I personally live that out in my own, in my own life? How am I called to be a witness? And I think the question we ask sometimes is, can I do that in Abbotsford? Can I do that here in my, in my own world? And the answer is yes, because the location doesn't matter. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that location, it doesn't matter. What matters is a surrendered and obedient life that says, Spirit, lead me. Have your way. Your will be done. So I want to I share a passage that I think will help us understand the how of, of living that out here. And I'm going to share a passage, and it's from Ezekiel 47, verses 1 to 6. And this is a vision that Ezekiel has, um, and a man leads him around this temple, and he shows him this river. And I'm going to read this, but it's, it's this vision that Ezekiel has of a river coming from the temple of God. Starting in verse 1. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and, he, and I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. Then he brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. As the men went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits. Then he measured off and then led me through water that was ankle deep. Then he measured off another thousand cubits and led me into water that was knee deep. Then he measured off another thousand cubits and led me into water that was up to the waist. Then he measured off another thousand, but now the river was that I could not cross because the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one would cross, no one could cross. And he asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then this man proceeds to take Ezekiel to the bank of the river, take him out and take him to the bank of the river. And then he shows him what this river would do, where it would go, and what it would accomplish. The river, this river... The water that was coming from this river was, was coming from the temple. It was fresh, and it was pure water. And it turned the salt water into fresh water so that it produced life everywhere it went. Trees and leaves and fruit and fish and living creatures all would benefit and flourish as a result of it. Another, another one of the verses says, So where the river flows, everything will live. The river that's being described here in this vision is the presence of God flowing from the temple. It's the presence of God pouring out on his people. It's the gospel going out to all people. The river is the impact that God's presence has on all nations, and everywhere it goes, it produces life. The salt water t- turning into fresh water is just like the sinner turning into saint God, saint, God redeeming things the way that he intended them to be. But when I first read this, I asked myself, why didn't the man just take him to the banks of the river first, Right? Because there's a better vantage point on the banks of the river. If you want to see where the river goes and what it would do further on, you would take them to the, to the banks of the river. Why lead him into the water first? Why lead him into where he couldn't even see or touch anymore? It wasn't until Ezekiel was led deeper into the river where he could no longer touch into the depth of this river so that he knew firsthand how deep and wide and powerful it was that the man revealed what the river was and what the river would accomplish. He was showing Ezekiel, you cannot be ankle deep. You can't be knee deep. You can't be up to your waist and still see God's plan and what the river will do. You have to be immersed in God's presence and who God is in order for you to see what he's going to do. It was when, so when he is ankle deep and knee deep and, and then even waist deep, he felt safe. He could touch. He was still comfortable and in control. And it was when he was no longer comfortable and in control where he could have had to swim that the man opened up Ezekiel's eyes to see God's plan of restoration. Growing up in Costa Rica, my family would often take us to the ocean, take us to the beach. Um, And in Costa Rica, we have some amazing surf, and we have also some very powerful and heavy waves. So as a family, we had this rule when, when we were little, especially not past your waist. You couldn't go out past your waist. We had this rule for a reason, because if a big wave comes in and just blasts you, you get, you get tossed around, you get tumbled around and everything. You maybe even get pinned down. But after the wave goes, it settles. 
you just kind of bounce, you get bounced back up and you stand up and the water's right here. And then when the wa- water pulls back out and those rip, that rip current and that undertow pulls, you have enough weight yet still underneath you that you can hold in, dig deep, and let the water rush out so it doesn't take you away. But if you wanted to ride the good waves, which we did, and if you wanted to get those good rides and those big waves, you had to go out past where you could touch. You had to go out past the breaks, and you had to get yourself in that space where you could no longer have that feeling of con- control and comfort. And I think that's the same thing when it comes to us and God. It's the same thing when we need to go fully into God's presence where we can't, where our feet can't touch the ground anymore. So many of us are constantly wrestling with this desire to follow God and wanting to have say and control in our lives. We're wrestling with that, going back and forth. I want to follow you, God, but I still want to have say and control in my own life. And yes, of course, God, I, you are Lord of my life until you ask me to do something uncomfortable or out of my comfort zone or something like that, and we'll see. And it seems backwards to us, but when we are no longer in the driver's seats of our lives, that God shows up in the most amazing ways. But often we're unwilling to let go of that control. And it can seem very confusing to us, but when we're outside of our comfort zones, where we feel like our feet can't touch anymore, that's when God places us on his firm ground. And I have some examples that I want to share from my own life where I saw God's power despite my lack of of control and despite my feelings stretched outside of my comfort zone. So I'm going to be sharing some stories with you. Most of my time as a missionary was spent in India. Uh, I've been to India four times, once for two weeks, another time for two months, another time for over two months, and the last time for a year and a half. So the stories I'm going to be sharing with you today are mostly from India. The first story was from my first outreach. I was a brand new Christian. I'd gone to YWAM, Youth with a Mission, in Australia, and just recently before I'd become a Christian. And in those three months of the lecture phase that we have, they break break down all the other stuff, and they bring you back into this basic relationship with God. And so I was just a brand new believer. And then we went on outreach to India. Myself and a a group of young adults and a leader, we went to India on outreach. And we would travel around, and we'd share the gospel um, and I shared my testimony before, and I had I'd shared the gospel, but just in small areas and small ways. And I was still really young. I was still really insecure. I was still just figuring out who I was in God. And on one occasion, we, we found ourselves in, in this place called Vishakhapatnam. It's on the Bay of Bengal, east of India, e- on the east side of India. And uh, we were going to different places, and, and on this one occasion, we were asked to go uh, to be a part of a crusade. Now, our team didn't know what that meant or where that was or what we were going to be doing, but right before we left to go, my leader says, hey, Justin, you're going to be sharing today. What, what am I going to be sharing? He said, I don't know. You have to figure that out. You better start praying. And we get in the car and start driving. And I'm like, well, God, I don't know what I'm going to say. Like, what am I going to do? I, and like, yeah, if you thought I was nervous coming up here, man, I, it, was, it, was, it was bad. So on the way, I'm thinking, God, what am I going to share? What am I going to do? And we arrive at this massive field, this huge open field. And there's a massive stage set up with speakers and We're led up through the back onto the stage where there's these chairs of honor. And we sat down on these chairs and look out on this field on thousands upon thousands of people. And I was not prepared for that at all. And it did not help me at all in the whole, like, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And if you ask yourself that question a thousand times, guess what? You're not going to have anything else to say. But I did that. And that was from my own experience. I learned that. And after I'm thinking, like, what am I going to say? I get this nudge hey, you're up. The translator's looking at me, and he calls me forward, and I'm like, uh, I don't speak English. <laughs> but he said, don't worry, I do, so that's fine. So um, I walked up on stage, still not knowing what to say. I grabbed the mic, and I am so nervous. But then something extremely unusual happened. I just began speaking, and speaking, and preaching, and speaking. And, but it it wasn't me speaking. It was almost as if, it wasn't this out-of-body experience by any means, but it was almost as if I, I took a passenger seat. I wasn't thinking about the next things that I'm going to say, like I am now processing, okay, where do I want to take this? I wasn't thinking about uh, how is it going to be received and, and what does the gospel need to be shared? What part of this needs to be shared? I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just a participant. I was a passenger. It's never happened to me before and it's never happened to me after. But I preached and preached and, and it was well received. And then after 
I just finished, I stopped, and I realized I'm done. And that's when I kind of came back into the not passenger seat. And I'm holding the mic, and I guess I look at the translator, and I put the mic down, and I guess I'm done. And I walk back to the chairs where the rest of my team was who had been with me for months. And they're looking at me like, what was that? Where, who was that? I just shrugged my shoulders. I, I don't know. I sat down, and, and I, I was blown away. They were blown away. And I'm not sure the impact, I'm not sure of the impact that it had. I don't know how many people came to faith that day. I don't know how many lives were changed that day as a result of God speaking through me. But in that moment, God showed up powerfully for me. He demonstrated that his power was made available through me and in me. In that moment, I knew that I could trust him, even if I didn't know what to say, when to say, or how to say it. And in that moment, his word became truth to me. Not just because it was in the Bible, but truth because it was truth. Matthew 10, 19 to 20 says, Don't worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. That moment shaped the rest of my life. That moment shaped the fact that I could trust God with anything and everything. I was stretched out of my comfort zone, and God's power was made available to advance his kingdom, advance the gospel. And this next story I want to share, um, I was now a leader of a team, taking a team of, of young adults to India. This is, uh, this, is a, this is actually the outreach that I met Nicole on, or this is the time that I met Nicole, and I, met that I, I, I saw that she was a wonderful woman, and I, I realized I want to marry her. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yes. Locked it in. That's a different story for a different time. Yeah. No outs, though. <laughs> um, and uh, this story, I'm going, to, I'm going to PG this story a little bit, just um, so you're going to have to read between the lines, parents. I just, just it's a little bit intense, so I'm going, to, I'm going to share this story in a little bit where you're going to have to read between the lines. But on this outreach, we went to a different place called Ongol, outside of Hyderabad in Andhra Pradesh in India. And we would go from village to village preaching and sharing, and we were part of a church. And we partnered with this church to do a lot of ministry. And on one occasion, we were in a uh, worship meeting and where we'd pray for people and, and share the gospel. And, and, and we had a Christian prayer meeting this time, and it was really cool. But uh, this Hindu woman came and joined us, and she, she loved the worship. She felt peace in this worship. And after this prayer time and worship time, uh, I was praying for people, and all of us would scatter and pray for people in this, in this uh, meeting. And I was praying for this one person. And Ashok, our translator, came up and said, Justin, come here, come here. We need your help. And I, so I come over, and there's a woman, this woman, this Hindu woman that joined us uh, on the ground, and she was, she was flailing and convulsing, and, and, and I knew right away that she was spiritually afflicted by something. And I, even though I knew that, I had no understanding of how to do anything about it. I didn't, have, I didn't attend any conference on deliverance. I didn't even read a pamphlet that said, this is what you should do or how. I had no idea what to do or any experience with it. Yet Ashok dragged me over reluctantly, and we started praying for this woman. And I'm like, God, just heal her. I don't know what you need to do. Heal her, heal her. The rest of the team was praying for her. And as we prayed, God started speaking different things to each one of us. God spoke to me, you should wash the bindi off of her forehead. This bindi represents, in Hinduism, it represents a spiritual eye, into a third eye into the spiritual world. So I took some water and I washed it off of her forehead and I just prayed, Lord, that you would purify her and clean her. And as I washed this, this off of her forehead, the rest of the team, the girls on the team started singing, uh, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. They started singing, the blood of Jesus washes us white as snow. And as they sung that, something snapped in her where before her eyes were dark and now her eyes were light and, and opened and she snapped out of whatever was happening and she looked up at everybody confused like what's happening and wiping water off of her forehead and and we all let go and then she she was embarrassed she stood up and she left and so we're like oh man so I processed with the team I don't know what happened I don't know what what's going to happen with that but we spent some time praying and then we went home the next day this woman went all throughout this village asking where are they where are those people and they, she came and looked from everywhere and finally found the girls on the team and she came and she told them that. She came to this worship meeting that night. And when she arrived, she, she felt peace in this worship. But then it's something, she kind of just blacked out. And then she woke up on the ground surrounded by people. And she felt confused and she didn't know what happened. So she left embarrassed. And she went home. And after some 
rest or whatever, she finally lay down and slept. And she said, she told the women, the the girls on the team, this was the first time that she had slept through the night in years upon years, ever since she could remember, because through the night when she would sleep, she would feel spiritually afflicted. She didn't feel that at all. She came and she found the girls and she said, what did you do to me? What, what did you do to me? And they said, we didn't do anything. That was Jesus. Jesus healed you. And then she said, who is this Jesus? Tell me, I want, I want to receive Jesus. And so they shared the gospel with her. She gave her life to the Lord. We connected her into the church that we are serving alongside. We would continue to go on from village to village. We traveled across India. But about a month later, we got an email from the pastor telling us that she was baptized, telling us that she became a member of that church and a full-on Christian, and she was thriving and joyful. But that meant a lot of conflict for her, too, and a lot of trial for her, because her father was a Hindu priest, and they were of the Brahmin caste. And in India, the caste system reigns, and if you are of this caste, then everything is fine for you and helpful for you. But if you're a Christian, you're of the lower class, the lower caste. But yet, she decided to live this out. And it was, it was a very powerful time for us in our, fa- in, in our, uh, in our uh, group as well, but in her life. That we didn't, we didn't know what to do in that time. We were unexperienced, uncomfortable, out of control. But God showed up in power to allow us to be his witnesses for the advancement of the gospel. On another occasion on that outreach, we were uh, in, another, in another place, in another village, and we'd go house to house doing prayer uh, for healing for people that were sick. Um, different people would ask um, our translator and pastor if we could come to their house and pray. And so we go from house to house praying for people. And on the team, before we even left from Australia to go to India, the team, we, we said, what do we want to see happen? What do we want to see God do through our team on this time? And one of the prayers from the, from the team was, we want to see God do a miraculous healing so that people would come to know him better and deeper. And we had gone from house to house, and we have been praying for people for, for a long time, but we hadn't ever seen any miraculous signs. Some really cool things happened, but never any miraculous healings. And on this time, we went to this house, and um, before we walked in, the translator said to us, the man that's living here is on his deathbed. He's going to die. He hasn't, he hasn't left. He hasn't, he's been bedridden for weeks. He hasn't been able to eat for over a week or drink uh, every time. He can't keep it down. He has typhoid fever, and... We, we just want you to pray that he would know Jesus so that he can go to heaven. So we walked into this room, and the odor was just overpowering and overwhelming. This man laid in his bed. Instead of this beautiful brown skin, he was yellow. The skin was, like, hanging off his clothes like loose clothing, or sorry, hanging off his bones like loose clothing. His eyes were sunken in. It was just, it was really a really difficult um, place to be. And I don't know about the rest of the team, but I didn't have much faith for healing for this, for this man. But we prayed for him, and I just prayed, Lord, I just hope that he knows you. And we, we prayed over him and, and just asked that God would do what he could do. Later on that day, so as we left, we left that place a little bit sad because we didn't see anything. And we didn't know if there's anything was going to happen. And we, we carried on in our ministry. And that night we, had, we stayed in that village, which was uncommon to stay the entire day. And uh, we stayed and we had a worship service. And we... we uh, we shared the gospel, we had some worship times, and we prayed for people. And afterwards, we go around sharing with people and, like, meeting people. And so, and Ashok would translate, would take me, hey, meet this person, meet this person. And, oh, God bless you, it's good to see you, and talk a little bit. And he brought me to this one man, and he says, here, look here. And I was like, hey, nice to meet you. And, he, and Ashok says, you don't remember him? I'm like, no, I just met 40 other <laughs> guys that look just like him to me, and I, I, don't know, I don't know who this is. And he says, this is the man that you prayed for earlier. And as I looked closer, I realized that this was the man, but he was no longer yellow, but he was brown. And his skin wasn't hanging off of his bones anymore, but he actually had flesh. And his eyes weren't sunken in, and he was smiling, and he was joyful. And I couldn't even believe it, but I called the girls over, uh, the rest of the team over, which was predominantly girls. And uh, they all came over, and when they saw him, they started crying. They knew right away who it was. And they knew that God had answered this prayer that they had to see healing in his life and to see healing on this trip. God's power was made available that, at that time. Like God healed this man and he used this healing to witness to many despite our lack of faith. 
God's power isn't dependent on our abilities, but rather on our willingness and our obedience to say, yeah, I surrender, have your way. And even if I didn't know or believe that that man could be healed, it didn't matter to God. He said, I can do it. We can do it. I want to share more stories of my time in India, but like I said, missions isn't only about being in India or these other developing nations to see these kind of things happen. It can be in our own home. So wherever we are willing to let God use us to be his witnesses, that's where his power is made available. So I want to share just a quick story from after Nicole and I got married, we went back to YWAM Australia, and we now led DTSs. And um, we lived in this little uh, suburb called Mitchelton outside of Brisbane. And this was our home. This is where we lived. This is where uh, we did everything. And um, we were a young married couple, so we didn't have a lot of money. And one day, Nicole was walking through the neighborhood, and as she walked by a house, she felt like God said to her, take $100 and give it to whoever is living there. So she came and talked to me about it. We always talked about finances. And she came and said, hey, I felt like God told me to go give $100 to the people that live there. And like a good supportive husband, I said, no way. <laughs> you crazy? And uh, I, yeah, I was like, we don't have enough money as it is. Like, and you want to give away $100? Like, it's pretty foolish to give away $100 when you only have 113 you know? We had more than that. It was probably 14 um, And like a good wife, she was like, okay, pray about it. I was like, oh, perfect. The pray about it thing. Yeah, okay, sure. So uh, the next couple of days, I, I, uh, I was just, I was torn up about it. I didn't want to give, I was like, we don't have that much money. We hardly have that much money. $100 might as well have been 10000 to us. It didn't matter. And... And I just didn't, I didn't want to give away this money that we had. But God kept on making this conflict in my heart. And, make, and after a while, he said, I want you to honor what I told to her. I want you to honor what she felt. So I reluctantly said, okay, yep. Yeah. And I surrendered and said, let's go get some money. We went and got money and went to the house. And Nicole walked up to the door, knocked on the door. And the woman answered, a woman answered. And Nicole said, as I was walking by last week, I felt like God said to give you $100. So here you go. And this woman was so, so shocked. And she proceeded to tell Nicole that she was struggling financially, that she had to leave the house that she was, li- that she was living in, that house, on Saturday, which was just a few days later. So if I was, if I was stubborn and I waited longer, we would have missed the opportunity. She was leaving that house on Saturday. She also told Nicole that she believed in God, but she had fallen away from her faith. And she had felt like it had been too long, and she, she just felt bad about herself and about her faith. But her coming to the door to, to, to give her $100, to give her this money, to show her that God, one, provided for her, that God, two, forgave her, loved her, still cared about her, to bring a stranger to come and share his love for her. So Nicole got to pray with her, and, and, and we, we never followed up with this lady. We never, we never, like, kept track of who this lady was. But I trust that in that moment, that kick-started her relationship with God again, and she's out there living a life full of faithfulness because God used a willing and surrendered person to say, here. And then that woman was able to know that God loves me. He'll provide for me. He'll forgive me. doesn't matter what my circumstances are. God loves me. See, God knew what that woman needed. God also knew that it was important to affirm Nicole's willingness to surrender and to be obedient. And God knew that I was stubborn, and he wanted to show me that he provided. And he also, we also, even though we gave that money away, that was a lot of the money that we had, we never went for one. We never had, we never were in need. He always provided. And now this story might not have the same wow factor as the other fact, as the other stories, but the impact was just as powerful. God showed up to restore what was broken. God showed up in power to restore what was broken, that relationship with that woman. That is the gospel. The last story I want to share with you is from here in Abbotsford this last Christmas. So Nicole and I have a heart to, uh, to love on and share the love of God with the homeless people in our community. And so every year at Christmas time, and we want to instill that heart and that love in, uh, in the lives of our kids. So every year at Christmas time, we go to the store and we buy gloves and socks and granola bars and goodies. And we get our hands on jackets and sleeping bags and blankets. And then we take them home. And we wrap them. We Christmas wrap them. We get Christmas paper and we have time with the kids. And we tell them, I want you to pray that this specific gift would go to a specific person that God wants it to go to. And then I want you to pray and ask God, 
what do you want me to say to this person? What, what, what message do you want to speak to this specific person? So then the kids take Sharpies and they write this message onto these Christmas gifts. And then we go out, and, you know, right around Christmas time, and uh, we go into downtown Abbotsford and we pray, Lord, lead us to whoever you want us to, lead, to, uh, to take these gifts to. And um, now I'd like to say that I'm super comfortable when I take the kids out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, taking children out to, uh, you know, drug-infested areas, that's, that's super good parenting right there, you know. Uh, and I'd like to say that I'm comfortable, but the truth is, is, is I'm still very cautious. I'm still very, you know, somewhat apprehensive of taking the kids to these places where I don't know who these people are or what they might do. But we still feel God's blessing on it, so we go anyways. And so this Christmas we went downtown, and I jumped out near the train tracks downtown, and we asked a couple men. I, I step out of the vehicle first, and I go talk to them. Hey, would you like to receive some Christmas presents? My family is wrapped, and, and we want to bless you. So these two men were like, yeah, absolutely, and they, they put some of their drugs away and some of their things away, and they tied it up, which I thought was really cool. And then I got two of the kids out at a time so we don't overwhelm them, and myself and the two kids come out, because we have 17 kids, and so myself and the two kids come out, and uh, we go over to these men, and Isaiah and Malka came this time, and uh, they handed the gifts to these men. And it really isn't anything special. It's socks and gloves and, and, and granola bars and, and whatever. It's nothing, nothing crazy, and we ask if they need blankets or anything like that. So this one guy, he opens it up, tears it up. He sees, oh, cool, you know, thank you so much. You guys are great. And this other man, this other gentleman in his 60s or 70s, or, uh, he, he, he sees this gift, and Isaiah points. He's like, hey, I wrote you a message. I wrote you a note. So the man, he's like looking at it, and he sees the message, and it says something along the lines. I can't remember exactly. I wish I would have remembered exactly, but it says, God loves you so much, and, and I love you too. <laughs> and, but the demeanor on this man changes and it just lights him up. It, it lit him up. And, and instead of ripping the, the, the paper apart, and all, he carefully pulls the tape back. And he kind of just puts the other stuff down. He didn't even care. And he holds this paper. And he shows his friend, look, look, look at this. Look what this kid made for me. And he looked at Isaiah and he's like, I'm going to take this. I'm going to show this to all my friends. It's completely changed this guy's heart. And so what, we asked him if we could pray for him. So myself, Isaiah, and Malachi, and these two grown men are holding hands downtown Abbotsford in the middle of the night, praying in a circle. And uh, it was a really powerful time for us. And um, these men felt loved. They felt dignity. They felt valued. They, they felt belonging, even within our family, just for a little bit. And my kids felt joy from being obedient to what God told them, and they felt they felt God speak in and through them, like even Isaiah, to be able to like, know that he, his words through Christ made an impact on someone's life. In all these stories where God showed up in powerful ways, myself, others, were out of, out of our comfort zones, not in control. But as we surrender to God and we pray, Spirit, lead me, his power shows up. See, the truth is we don't need to go to India we don't need to, to see God move. We don't need to be full-time ministry. We don't need to, to, to do anything special. The common denominator in all these stories is surrender to God and the desire to spread the gospel. When we surrender to God, we're saying we're being willing to be uncomfortable, go, to be immersed into God, go deeper where our feet can't touch, but knowing that he's going to take control and that he'll lead us and guide us. And the desire to spread the gospel to say, God, I want to advance your kingdom. God, use me to spread your gospel truth to others. That's when God's power shows up. God can use you here, there, anywhere, as long as you are willing to say, Spirit, lead me. I want to read what the man uh, says to Ezekiel as he closes out the description of the river's effect on the land. As this river of God goes out on the land, Ezekiel 47, 12 says, Their leaves will not wither, nor will, the will, will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food, and their leaves for healing. Jesus promises us something very similar. Similar, He promises this to his disciples in John chapter 7, verse 38. He says, Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Rivers of living water will flow from within them. And just like the river of God that coming out of the temple that produced life everywhere it went, that's the same rivers that we have available within us from the temple of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's my prayer for all of us as carriers of the gospel and of God's power and of the Spirit. 
Let's pray. As I pray and as the worship team comes up, I want to I wanna invite you to uh, just to consider, Lord, is there something that I'm holding on too much to? Is there something that I'm saying I'm unwilling to be uncomfortable in? Is there something that you want to draw me into? Reflect on yourself and then also ask this, yourself this question, God, is there somewhere specific that I can advance your gospel? And then maybe ask even yourself this question about your heart. What do I want to see happen in my life? What impact do I want to have on those that I encounter? Is there something specific, whether it might be a, a healing or, or a word of knowledge or, or just, yeah, even God speaking through you when you don't know it's possible? Pray and ask that to the Father. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for Pentecost. We thank you that the Holy Spirit came upon all of us. I thank you that no longer are we separate from this covenant. No longer are we separate from being your children. But we are now heirs, heirs of you, Father. We are your kids, and we have the promised Holy Spirit, and that rivers of living water can flow from within us and do flow from within us. We thank you for the relationship that we have in you. We thank you for the redemption that you've brought each one of us. And we thank you that you equip us with the gospel. And when we go out to share your gospel, when we surrender, your power is made available in and through us. And Lord, we pray that you continue to show us what areas of our life that we need to lay down and let go of. What areas of our life do we need to relinquish some of that control and to say, have your way. Let our feet not touch the ground anymore, being immersed in you and your river and follow what you have for us. Please reveal that to each one of us as you call us. We thank you, Father, and we commit this word to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
God has called each one of us here to be at the advancement of the gospel. And he's called you in a specific way. Ask the Lord, how do you want me to do that? How can I do that for you? And let him lead you and show you his power made available through your willingness and your surrender to share the gospel. I'm going to share a benediction with you this morning out of Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. May he work in us what is pleasing through him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you today. Thank you.